So Drew gave a great introduction to Colin, um, and, and perhaps your name is pronounced differently. I've heard it pronounced- uh, Grabo. Grabo before, thank you. Um, and you did write a great um, thesis on the Jones Act. And I just want to, first of all, give you an opportunity to talk about that. But I want to preface it for the audience that it was written for the Jones Act from a national an international perspective and not necessarily from a Puerto Rico perspective. And so I want people to think about that um, as he's talking and giving kind of the overview. And I also want to kind of uh, present that um, when I first came to Puerto Rico, I was the chief strategy officer for Invest Puerto Rico. And we convened a group of all of the uh, uh, tr uh, shipping, um, uh, both air and cargo shipping entities on the island that we would meet on a weekly basis. And so a lot of the questions I'm going to ask are based on feedback after learning about this panel and reading Colin's thesis. Um, they're, they're kind of challenging questions because there's a different perspective to some of these things in Puerto Rico because of the unique position in Puerto Rico on some of the elements that are in your thesis. So first of all, I'm gonna give you the opportunity to talk about your thesis. Well, Gail, thanks uh, for moderating this discussion and thanks to the Icon Institute for inviting me. Um, I, I love talking about this topic, I think it's very important. I also appreciate the advantage to escape from DC for 24 hours. The temperature was 27 degrees when I checked my phone this morning, so I appreciate that. Um, so yeah, I'll give the case against the Jones Act and I'll try to do it from a Puerto Rico context. Um, so the Jones Act, for those unfamiliar, Section 27, the Merchant Marine Act of 1920, it basically says if you want to move goods by water between two points in the United States, you have to use a vessel that is U.S. flagged and registered, is built in the United States, is crewed by Americans, and at least 75% owned by Americans. So what do these provisions mean? Well, the U.S. flag requirement means you have to use American ships. American ships are very expensive. Uh, there was a 2011 study done by the U.S. government that found that they were about three times more expensive to operate than foreign flag ships. Uh, and then they have to be built in the United States. And this is where things get completely out of control. U.S. built ships are incredibly expensive. A U.S. built tanker is estimated currently to cost over $200 million compared to about $50 million overseas. A container ship, like the kind of ships that bring goods to and from the U.S. mainland of Puerto Rico, are roughly five times more expensive. Uh, there's only been one Jones Act ship delivered this year. It was a container ship. It cost over $225 million. A similar size ship was ordered in South Korea two years ago for $41 million. So who's paying that difference? Well, the people that have to use Jones Act shipping. The piper has to be paid. In this case, it's the people of Puerto Rico and other non-contiguous states and territories that have to rely on this shipping. So we have expensive operating costs, high capital costs, and on top of that, we have very limited competition. If you want to send goods to and from uh, Puerto Rico to Jacksonville, there are two companies that have 85% of the container capacity. That's Crowley and Tote Maritime. Competition is so limited in the Puerto Rico trade that in 2008, four U.S. shipping executives in the Jones Act trade, in the Puerto Rico trade, pled guilty to price fixing and a fifth pled guilty to destroying evidence. Um, and the only reason we know about that is because someone inside blew a whistle on them. Uh, and then on top of all of that, we also have a very limited number of ports to ship goods to and from Puerto Rico and the U.S. mainland. Something like 85, 90% of goods go to and from Jacksonville. So you want to send goods to Puerto Rico from somewhere in the U.S., you have to first get it to Jacksonville. Uh, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal, I think 10 years ago, where a guy in Maine ran a hardware store and he said, I want to send lumber to Puerto Rico, there are no ships in New England I can put it on. I gotta get it down to Jacksonville first on a truck and tack on all that cost, and then I gotta pay the added Jones Act cost of getting it there. So the Jones Act makes shipping to and from Puerto Rico and the US mainland, which is Puerto Rico's largest trading partner, very expensive, that's, built in, that's baked into the cake. Now obviously there are ways of getting around this. Uh, you can buy goods internationally. Instead of buying it from the U.S. mainland, you can buy it internationally. You can use efficient international shipping. That gives you some relief, but still, there's still a cost to be paid there. Um, in 2013, the, the Government Accountability Office did a study on the Jones Act's impact on Puerto Rico. And they uh, talked to people at the Puerto Rican Farm Bureau, and they said, look, you know, buying things like uh, fertilizer uh, and animal feed, it's about the same price in the U.S. and Canada, but after I factor in the cost of transportation, it makes more sense to buy Canadian, even though Canada's 500 miles further away. Well, without the Jones Act, you could buy it from America in shorter distance, presumably cheaper shipping, too. Um, 
You know, there are other examples in there, you know, things like corn and potatoes, uh, jet fuel being bought from Venezuela instead of the Gulf Coast uh, because of the cost of shipping. But sometimes buying American, it's not just more expensive. You don't buy foreign to save a few bucks, you buy foreign because it's impossible to buy American. I think the most notorious example of this is liquefied natural gas. We talked earlier some of the discussions about the cost of electricity in Puerto Rico and the reliability. Puerto Rico uses natural gas for something like 43% of its power generation. 100% of its bulk LNG comes from abroad because there are no Jones Act compliant tankers to transport it from, from other parts of the United States. Um, so, you know, this year so far, roughly half of Puerto Rico's LNG has come from Nigeria. I flew yesterday from DC to Orlando and Orlando to San Juan. On the way down to Orlando, I passed by Savannah. I flew by, I saw out the window, I took a photo of it, an LNG export facility. It's about three days from here. They export LNG all over the world. They can't send it to Puerto Rico, not despite being part of the United States, but because it's part of the United States. This is absolutely crazy, and there's a cost to that. Um, Dominican Republic, right next door, they use US LNG for something like 60% of their supply, which suggests it's the best deal to be had. And in 2019, the head of PREPA testified before Congress that the inability to source American LNG cost PREPA hundreds of millions of dollars in lost savings. I've seen estimates anywhere from 80 to $300 million a year being lost. You want to improve your electrical grid? You want to bring down prices? Get, a, get a Puerto Rico access to cheaper U.S. energy. So, you know, ultimately, the Jones Act raises the cost of shipping to Puerto Rico. And for an island economy, that's a pretty big deal. Uh, back in the 1980s, the government of Puerto Rico said that the cost of shipping has a decisive impact on the economic and social development of Puerto Rico. And they're not alone. Uh, I think anyone that approaches this issue with an open mind uh, can see the cost. In 2015, economist Ann Kruger uh, issued her report studying the economy of Puerto Rico and identified the Jones Act as a prominent obstacle to Puerto Rico's growth. In 2020, the RAND Corporation released a study about Puerto Rico's economy and it listed five main impediments, one of which was the Jones Act. The report mentioned the Jones Act over 100 times. I think that speaks to the prominence, uh, the significance of the Jones Act in impeding Puerto Rico's growth. Um, you know, I'll just la lastly add, you know, Puerto Rico is interesting because unlike most parts of the United States, Puerto Rico hasn't always been subject to U.S. shipping laws. Of course, Puerto Rico is originally part of Spain before it was conquered in 1898. What's interesting is they went from having no Jones Act to being subject to U.S. shipping restrictions. Two years later, 1900, a prominent group of Puerto Ricans went to the United States, present a petition to Congress outlining um, some of their, their, their grievances with the U.S. policy, and they also published an, editor, uh, an opinion piece in the New York Times. Uh, among these, they cited U.S. shipping laws, which they called a grievous hardship. In 1930, the Brookings Institution identified U.S. shipping laws as an impediment to Puerto Rico's growth. In the 1960s, Congress had hearings about shipping in which the government of Puerto Rico complained about the cost of, of U.S. shipping. So this isn't new, and it's been exerting this burden on Puerto Rico for decades. Uh, and I can't help but think about where Puerto Rico could be absent this burden. And lastly, you know, <laughs> um, and, and lastly, I, I think I'll just talk about, you know, set economics aside, and let's talk about just fairness for a second. Puerto Rico is the only U.S. territory to which the Jones Act is fully applied. Right next door in U.S. Virgin Islands, no Jones Act. Um, and Puerto Rico has no vote in Congress, really. They have one non-voting uh, representative. They have no representation in the Senate. They can't vote for president. And, and they have a 40% poverty rate. If Puerto Rico was a U.S. state, it'd be by far the poorest state. They always subject them to the world's most expensive shipping. W what are we doing? You know, just set aside, how is that fair? How is that just moral? Um, so I, I think that's basically the case I'd, I'd make against the Jones Act. Thank, thank you. Thank you, and I, I think it's clear what Colin's position is in his thesis. <laughs> um, and this might be surprising to, to people that um, there, are, there are actually contrary opinions um, in Puerto Rico, and I've, I've listed them. I've talked to, the, to Colin about them a little bit because I wanted to give him a heads up that uh, we're gonna have a, a, a challenging uh, discussion. <clears throat> Probably the most compelling, and again, my background is economic development. 
And so one of the most compelling things as I started calling Ron and surveying people was the idea that um, with the Jones Act, and so any of anyone who understands the labor markets in Puerto Rico, um, when I first came here as an economic developer, the, the island really relies heavily on two things for um, maintaining competitiveness within its industry, and that is high uh, uh, tax incentives and low wages. And in fact, on average, wages on the island in comparable industries um, to other locations is about 40% lower for the same job, same um, uh, industry. And so one of the arguments given is that um, the Jones Act actually equalizes that in the shipping industry, which is a significant industry for the island. Um, and so that wages in that, because they're set by the Jones Act and by the unions and, and some of those um, entities, it's to a benefit for those individuals on the island of Puerto Rico. Um, and, and so before you respond to that, though, I do want to ask about um, the, the Virgin Islands. So it's my understanding that they, they are subject, they just don't have a shipping industry of note of the size of Puerto Rico. Uh, the Virgin Islands <coughs> has been exempted from the Jones Act since 1936. Uh, it's actually an interesting backstory. So the uh, Virgin Islands became, uh, they were purchased by the United States from Denmark in I think 1917, something like this. And from 1920 onwards, they were subject, uh, to, they had an exemption to the Jones Act, but every year the president would have to decide do they get it for another year, the exemption, or do I impose it? And the representatives from, from the U.S. Virgin Islands, they hated this because they basically had this hanging over them. Are we going to have the Jones Act or not? And they, they lobbied Congress and said, please exempt us. So finally, in the Merchant Marine Act of 1936, they got an exemption. And what's really instructive is that back in, I think, the 70s or so, there was an effort by some members of Congress to apply the Jones Act to the Virgin Islands, and, and they fought very strongly uh, because they recognized the harm that it inflicts on them. Uh, you know, if the Jones Act offers such a, such a screaming value uh, proposition, why aren't they clamoring to be part of it? The fact that they've actively resisted for so long, I, I think, is, is, is um, very instructive. But to your point thank, about thank wages, you. I, I think, you know, the argument, as I understand it, is basically, um, you know, uh, well-paying jobs are a precious commodity. Uh, this gives us some well-paying jobs, and we should try to preserve that. Um, and it equalizes them to the U.S. mainland standards. Yeah, well, that's good for the handful of people that get those jobs, but that's very bad for everyone else that has to pay the increased shipping prices to pay for those jobs. I mean, those people are richer by making other people poor. Um, you know, we talked earlier, there was a discussion about the restaurant business and inflation and the cost of things and 85% of things being brought in from elsewhere. Well, part of that cost is shipping. Uh, this is a tax that is basically imposed on people. We don't make an island economy stronger by making shipping more expensive. This is just very fundamental, I think. And the idea that this is a, a, a net good, I, I just think, uh, flies in the face of everything we know about economics. Well, and again, just from, a, from an economic perspective and looking at um, creating uh, a, uh, independence within your own economy, one of the things that has happened, and I'll cite an example, is um, there was a store that I'm aware of that was that um, operates six stores on the island of, a grocery store, six stores on the island of Puerto Rico. And they don't have a lot of, or they, they primarily focus on natural and organic goods. But they don't have a lot of fresh goods. And when we met the owner and asked, the comment was exactly what you're talking about. It's because every week he's got to ship things to Jacksonville personally, and then from Jacksonville, bring them over to the island. And so from a fresh goods perspective, that doesn't work well. But what that created was an environment then where the island would be able to support farmers who could grow goods on the island of Puerto Rico in those higher margins and be able to fill that gap. So there's kind of this idea that there would be economic equalizing to those things where shipping creates a barrier for an island, that it creates more independence. So what would be your thought on that? Well, <clears throat> my thought on that is I just think that consumers should be able to give, have the choice. They can weigh the, um, the various alternatives. Yes, I can buy here from Puerto Rico, and that is a certain price, or I can import it from abroad, and that is a certain price. And they can seek out the best value and what works best for them. And I don't think we should be in the business of picking winners and looters and say, we're going to promote this sector at the expense of everybody else. Let, let, let the consumer decide what's, their, what's in their best self-interest. Yes, I, I think that's a, that's a very fair re response. Does anyone in the audience have a, res uh, a question or a thought related to that particular question? And I'm going to have another one next. Uh, yes. Uh, hi. Uh, 
going through college, I was able to work uh, an internship in the port of San Juan. And one of the things that they teach you when you learn about the Jones Act, it's that it is used uh, to help unions. And uh, fundamentally, the money that it brings helps union workers and all these things. Uh, working in the port of San Juan, I was encountered by the people that were offloading a, uh, a ship. Uh, and those unionized employees made $30 an hour. I could count with one hand the people that I know that have degrees, the average bachelor's degrees that start jobs and make $30 an hour. And then these people, uh, not to judge, but some were ex-convicts, some had some records, and it is impressive to see how we kind of help them out more than we help the people who try to you know, do things, and on top of that, brings a burden in the economy. And I wanted to see your opinion on the Jones Act's correlation to unions and how it's justified. Yeah, so <clears throat> the Jones Act, the fact that we still have this law, it, in large part, owes, um, is, is due to union support. Um, this is primarily the unions that crew the ships. So we're talking about the masters, mates, and pilots union that work on the ships, the Marine Engineers Beneficial Association, the Seafarers International Union. Um, port workers do not fall under the Jones Act because they unload any ship. It doesn't matter if it's foreign, American, whatever. Uh, those jobs will still be here uh, it, regardless if there's a Jones Act. As long as our ship's coming in, they'll be employed. In fact, you can argue without the Jones Act, made shipping cheaper, probably more shipping, more jobs in our ports. Um, but so, and a lot of those, those unions I mentioned earlier, they fall under the bigger union umbrella. So for example, the AFL-CIO, which is an umbrella, uh, union umbrella organization, they fully support the Jones Act. And if you're, say, you know, a Democratic politician, um, you're trying to win a primary, you want union support, uh, endorsing the Jones Act is a good way to go about that. So yeah, that's the, you, you've identified some of the political economy behind this law and why things, you know, remain the way they are in spite of the clear harm that I think has been demonstrated over the years. I know there was a, com a question over here as well. Is there any, oh, Colin, I thought your presentation was spectacular. Thank you. Uh, your name is Colin, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so is there any awareness in Washington that the Jones Act, as it's uh, inflicted upon the people of Puerto Rico, is an invitation to corruption? Uh, number one, by the large families that benefit from it and sort of hide from the spotlight here in Puerto Rico through their monopoly price fixing, which you mentioned. And second of all, the 12 politicians who are taking million dollar bribes to allow global ports, Russia's port company, to buy the port of San Juan surrounding a US military base, the Coast Guard. Does it not seem like a, like a, a problem to have Russia buying Puerto Rico's port? Well, <clears throat> to be clear, the Jones Act doesn't apply to ports. It's, it's the, the vessel operations. So something like a foreign country investing a port, that falls under something else called CFIUS, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, has to pass a, a review process. But it's funny that you bring up Russia. Um, something I didn't mention, we talked about LNG earlier. And we're told often that you know, beyond the union stuff, the Jones Act is important in US national security. Um, well, you know, February of last year, Russia invaded Ukraine. That same month, Puerto Rico imported LNG that originated in Russia. So we're buying from the Russians instead of the United States, and we're told this is all about national security. I mean, you can't make this up. Um, so yeah, and in fact, uh, now I think about the uh, Washington Examiner magazine last year had an article about the Jones Act, and they had a, a cartoon that had Vladimir Putin and Uncle Sam was handing him over, you know, a, a wad of cash, and it was labeled like Jones Act or something like that, um, because this is this is what the law does. I uh, also just mentioned that, you know, after after the invasion, the U.S. Uh, banned imports of Russian oil, and it turned out, like, um, the Philadelphia Inquirer had an article mentioned a local refinery, something like twenty something percent of its oil was coming from Russia. And it was the same grade of crew that you can get from the Gulf Coast. Well, why are they buying it from Russia instead of the Gulf Coast? Well, the article spelled it out. It said using U.S. flag ships is very expensive. So these are the kinds of absurd distortions that, you know, it's absurd economically, but you can also make a very plausible argument. This isn't our national security interest either. Th thank you. Thank you. Um, and so the next, the next point that people had brought up to me was the idea that 
without the Jones Act, deliveries and routes would actually go down. And so kind of the concept behind that being um, what, what happens, and sometimes, again, from an economic perspective, we say that the island of Puerto Rico has a market of about 3.5 million. The Caribbean, when you think of the islands that are contiguous by water, um, has about 26 million, I think, uh, it, uh, it was the uh, latest number. And the Caribbean Basin, which is all the countries that border the uh, by water um, in Central and South America, it's about 43 million. And so it positioned the industry in Puerto Rico to be able to be a distribution point um, for foreign shipments that then couldn't go on to the U.S. And so the fear is by eliminating that, you eliminate some of that capability or that positioning from a distribution um, industry perspective. Yeah, so an argument you hear a lot in favor of the Jones Act is that <clears throat> it makes shipping very reliable. And, and this is, there's kind of a perverse logic to this because Jones Act shipping is so expensive, no one else wants it. They don't go to the Dominican Republic. They're not going to other countries. They just go between U.S. Uh, ports, you know, basically usually San Juan and Jacksonville, and every now and again there's a ship that goes from here to Houston. They just go on these shuttle routes back and forth, back and forth. So you can say, well, it's more reliable. Well, you know, there are, you know, for example, express trains uh, that, that go from here to there, and they charge a certain price. And you can take, you know, local trains that make more stops, and it's usually a lower price. My attitude is, if it's such a great deal, then you shouldn't have a problem competing on the open market. Um, so let people decide which, you know, which option is better for them. Let them vote for the, with their dollars. But then you also hear an argument that, well, you know, foreign flagships, maybe they're less reliable. This doesn't make any sense. Crowley and uh, uses foreign flag ships. They use them to serve the U.S. Virgin Islands. I haven't heard anybody complain about, you know, they're subject to, to this dynamic you just described in the U.S. Virgin Islands. And again, the Virgin Islands doesn't want any part of the Jones Act. Uh, Tote Maritime, which is the other big shipping company that serves Puerto Rico, they're owned by a company called Salt Chuck. Salt Chuck also owns another company called Tropical Shipping. Tropical Shipping is 100% foreign flag shipping. Um, I, and again, I struggle with the notion that on the one hand, salt chucks tote, they offer superior service, but if they use tropical shipping, this is terrible service. It's the same company. Um, so I think these arguments really fall apart un under any kind of scrutiny. So, so because you mentioned the um, U.S. Virgin Islands again, if they have not had the Jones Act since the 1930s, why are they not the shipping hub for the Caribbean? Well, in fact, one of the reasons that uh, they, they kind of demanded that they were so insistent on being exempt from the Jones Act is because they were a shipping hub. Uh, back then, uh, what happened is, this is back in the days of uh, coal-fired ships, and they were, um, they were kind of a refueling point, a bunkering point for ships that were stopping by. They would load up on coal as they were going by the U.S. Virgin Islands. Well, the U.S. Virgin Islands, where did they get their coal from? They got it from Virginia. And basically said, look, if you subject us to the Jones Act, then that's going to be all Jones Act ships going from Virginia to here. It's going to be more expensive. We're going to have to raise the price of our coal, and then we're going to lose out to all our foreign competition to other islands that aren't subject to this. Um, you know, as far as why they aren't a major shipping hub today, well, it's the fact that... Compared you know, to uh, Puerto Rico. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's 100,000 people, whereas Puerto Rico is over 3 million. I mean, it's just it's a much smaller market. Um, so I think that explains it. But... Also Except the market, again, being the Caribbean and the Caribbean basin. Yeah, but you know, also I'll note that in 2012, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, which has jurisdiction over Puerto Rico, did a report on Puerto Rico's economy. And it pointed out that um, you know, the neighboring uh, Jamaica and the Dominican Republic, they have pretty prominent shipping hubs, uh, whereas Puerto Rico does not. And there's no mystery there. I mean, no one in their right mind would set up a major sh transshipment hub in Puerto Rico when all the shipping going between Puerto Rico and the world's largest economy is subject to the Jones Act. No one will do that. Um, so, I, yeah, I, I think it's a clear detriment. And I don't think you can compare, say, you know, Kingston, Jamaica, to uh, the U.S. Virgin Islands, that has a smaller port, just incredibly smaller scale operation. Sure, sure. And, and that's a great segue, actually, to one of the other comments, which is um, that this would hurt. So Puerto Rico has a very, in addition to sea shipping, um, they have a very active uh, air cargo shipping industry. And specifically, um, it's utilized by the medical device and the pharmaceutical industry because it's small um, uh, packaged goods. And there's fear that the reason why the price of that shipping 
that which supports the major industry on the island of Puerto Rico is low is because of the Jones Act, that it's a, um, it's a, 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 a interdependent relationship that if shipping by boat, which is slower, goes lower, it's going to increase the delivery time and diminish and the use of air cargo and raise costs there. So that's, that's kind of, sorry, it's a kind of a complicated question, but. Yeah, I mean, I would just say, I think Puerto Ricans should have all options and they should be able to decide for themselves what's the best, most efficient way of moving goods from point A to point B. I, I don't think having more options is ever a bad thing. <clears throat> But I, since you mentioned air cargo, uh, what's interesting to me is that uh, you know Alaska, Ted Stevens Airport in Anchorage, Alaska, and I'm going somewhere with this, has an interesting exemption where that uh, goods going, uh, cargo going from Asia that refuels in Alaska, they can stop there and they can swap cargo and they can say, oh hey, you're going to Los Angeles, well I'm going to New York, and you know I'll take your good that's going to there and you can take mine, and it's an efficient system. And Puerto Rico, I believe, applied for, and I think got the, a similar kind of exemption because there's a recognition yes. that with these fewer cabotage Tw restrictions, 2019. yeah, that this would kind of open up things and give more options and make it more attractive. Well, there's no reason that the same you know, logic wouldn't also hold for shipping restrictions. If we pare back those shipping restrictions, that would also produce benefits. I think it's interesting. I think the resident commissioner, she favors one but opposes you know, the other, and that's just a, a contradiction there. Well, I will say, uh, speaking on behalf of kind of the collective of the industry that as we would meet on a weekly basis, they also um, don't, they're not in favor of repealing the Jones Act, but they are in favor of expanding and actually making permanent um, the transshipment uh, 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 directive. So um, to your point a little. And then the last question, and then I actually want to um, do one last thing before we go. I want you to talk about, you have kind of some uh, a list in your thesis of some potential solutions that vary from uh, repealing law entirely to other options. Um, but I just want to get back to the national security piece. And only uh, having read your thesis, a lot of your nas national security um, discussion is around national security from having a fleet that has um, wartime readiness capability, basically. One of the other elements that entities have mentioned to me is the idea of national security in terms of Puerto Rico kind of being a buffer zone through the Jones Act. And so to your um, comment, and I don't know where you have that information, that's something I had not heard um, about the Russian um, uh, acquisition of the port um, of San Juan, but that Puerto Rico kind of becomes a Western border and by only having the U.S. Uh, manned, owned, and, and operated ships, it's a security border basically that goes extends um, from a maritime perspective. What, what, what's your thought on that? Well, you hear a variation on this argument sometimes. It basically says, look, by having U.S. Uh, crewed, U.S. built ships, uh, there's a certain reliability there. Uh, you know, foreign ships, who, who knows who's crewing there? We don't know what's going on. Uh, there's added security with American ships. The choice here is not, do we let in foreign ships or not? They're already here. I mean, the vast, the, something like two thirds, I think, the shipping that goes into San Juan is foreign ships. And the same holds true with American ports in the US mainland. They're full of foreign ships. The only question before us is can Americans use them or not for, for domestic trade? They go from port to port. They're here all that they're, they're in our waters. Um, so it's not as though we keep them in or out, it's can we use them or not? And, um, and I think it's absurd that we have, you know, there was a, a Congressional Research Service report a few years ago that pointed out that foreign ships will go, say, down the East Coast, and they will stop in multiple ports, and they will pick up uh, cargo that's destined for export going to a, a foreign country or dropping off imports that originated from abroad. And basically, this is a conveyor belt along our coasts that Americans can't use. And to me, that's crazy. So. Thank you, Noan. I think that's a great answer. And I just want to quickly, before um, Colin goes into his uh, four solutions, any other questions, comments, thoughts on any of the things we've talked about? And I can I, only oh. see up to where the balcony is. So Let me see if this is on. I, I do have a quick question. Um, sure. I'm over this way. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> curious as to what the government acknowledges comes back into Puerto Rico f as a benefit from the Jones Act, from a financial perspective. Uh, federal monies. What federal monies do they say are coming back? Well, the, the, the Jones Act is not a federal program, so there aren't, you know, if I were trying to steel man the case for the Jones Act, I guess, you know, they would say, 
the people, the, the, the handful of Puerto Ricans that work on Jones Act ships, you know, they get good jobs or something like that. Um, but I think, it, you know, it, it, to the extent that Jones Act provides jobs and benefits, you know, the vast majority of people that crew these ships, they live on the U.S. mainland, you know, supporting jobs in the U.S. mainland. There's no shipbuilding here in Puerto Rico, really, to speak of. You know, the shipyards that make Jones Act ships, those are on the mainland. So I think it's, it's obviously, I'm biased here, but I think it's really difficult to make the case that, uh, particularly in the context of Puerto Rico, that there are any significant benefits uh, accruing to the island. And, and Colin mentioned earlier, and it's online, you can find it, that I think it was in 2018, there was an extensive by the Government Accountability, uh, Office of Accountability, that talks about how they justify the Jones Act, regardless of the economic implications. And so it's really, I mean, in fact, the Transshipment Committee that I keep mentioning um, collectively wrote a letter in um, uh, 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 against that particular report as being inaccurate. So we had an entire letter um, pointing out some of the inaccuracies of that report, but you can find it online. And so Colin, uh, now in closing, if you could just uh, identify the four things you think um, our, our alternative pathways. Yeah, so so obviously we talk about the Jones Act a lot in binary fashion. Do we keep it? Do we get rid of it? Um, and uh, fortunately, there's a you know there's a whole spectrum I think of options between those two that uh, might be useful to explore. Uh, I don't think we're going to go from having the world's most restrictive cabotage law to having no cabotage law at least overnight. Uh, so I think there are other things worth exploring. One that strikes me as entirely um, reasonable and obvious would be say, in the event of you know I mentioned LNG a lot. Um, there are no U.S. ships providing that service. Why are we protecting something that doesn't exist? If there is no U.S. ship to offer that service, let people use a foreign ship. That should be an option. I think another thing is just exempting Puerto Rico uh, from the Jones Act. Again, it's the only U.S. territory that is fully subject to this law. Um, uh, that strikes me as entirely unfair. Another intermediate step could be, okay, say, you keep the Jones Act, but you eliminate the U.S. build requirements so that U.S. shipping companies can acquire ships at a reasonable cost, uh, just like they do with you know, airlines. You can't fly foreign airlines between Puerto Rico and the U.S. mainland, but you can use foreign built um, jets, and I think that saves a lot of money and makes the, air, the industry more competitive. Uh, that wouldn't just be good for Puerto Rico. I think it'd be good for the U.S. shipping industry, the thing that we're supposed to promote. The idea that we promote a strong, vibrant U.S. maritime sector by charging them five times the international price for new ships is absurd. Um, so I think that would be, you know, a pretty obvious win-win, and it would just bring the Jones Act in line with all our other cabotage laws, like airlines and trucking and all the rest. So I think those are uh, a few starting points for, I think, a good discussion about where we should go with the Jones Act. Great, great. Thank you. And Colin, thank you so much. And, and I just want to uh, have a disclaimer. Um, my opinion is not contrary to Collins, um, but that's my job as the moderator is to bring out, um, you know, both sides of the, the discussion and the argument. So does anyone else have any um, thoughts or closing comments regarding the discussion? Yes? Well, you just got me thinking because I actually didn't know about or didn't remember about the USVI not having the Jones Act. So how does that work if there's a three-way between USVI Puerto Rico who does, USVI who doesn't, and maybe Jacksonville or something. So does that, like, do, I guess how does that work if there's a US port that doesn't require it, but one of them does? Yeah, so basically, say for example, in the, in the case of Crowley and Tote, which are the two companies that control 85% of the container capacity, they will use US built Jones Act ships that just go back and forth between San Juan and, and Jacksonville. And then for uh, the Virgin Islands, they use foreign built, foreign flag ships that go from, I, th I think most of it goes out of Miami, and then they'll go to the Virgin Islands, but also hit a few other smaller Caribbean islands along the way and, and, and go back. So basically, they use two different uh, services for each one of these markets. So they're, okay, so they're just two entirely different routes. They don't even have yeah. anything that just go in between Puerto Rico and our neighbors, like you can see. Across. Yeah, and you would okay. think maybe in the Jones Act's yeah. uh, absence that this would be rationalized a bit and they could, you know, consolidate that and gain some efficiencies because obviously those foreign flagships, they sail right by Puerto Rico on the way to the Virgin Islands and, and you know, that's a missed opportunity there. So I, I would think there'd be some efficiencies that could be brought to bear. Yeah, interesting, thanks. Great. Well, thank you so much. Thank you again, uh, Colin, and we um, look forward. Actually, I hope everyone here will go online and read the report, um, the thesis that uh, Colin put together, because it's really fascinating. It's well-written, well, incredibly well-researched. So thank you so much for joining us here in Puerto Rico. Well, thank you, Gail.